Hello there, THP 494 and 598. So today what we're going to do is we're going to look at a couple different examples of generative design. And we're very fortunate because on the derivative wiki, um, there are a bunch of different examples of what this looks like. Uh, and in fact, if we head to the wiki here and look up generative design, we can see that there's actually a huge code pack where we can actually download a bunch of these example files. And we're going to take a look at one here from uh, Random and Noise, and we're going to take a look at another one here from Shape. And we're just going to kind of pull apart part of what's going on inside of these and try to understand a little bit better uh, how we might start to think about uh, making some of these things ourselves. Uh, so to get started here uh, in a new project, let's go ahead and get everything opened up. So let's go ahead and delete everything inside of this project and uh, start to look at what we're going to make. So to, for starters here, we're going to make something. Uh, we're going to make a little piece of art or a little piece of code that's going to make itself. And in this particular example, that looks like this. So this is the thing that we're going to try experimenting with here first. Uh, and this has got a kind of amorphous shape that keeps moving, shifting, and changing. Uh, it moves to a, a few different types of colors. We can see here there's kind of a gradient that's happening. We'll uh, have a better understanding of what's going on with all of that. And we can see how it moves uh, and dances here around this uh, our render area and what that means. So that's what we're going to set out to make here. And so let's get started. So getting started here, one of the first things we need to think about is how we're actually going to draw some of this. Uh, and for us, what we're going to do in this particular case is we're going to take advantage of some surface operators to help us get the geometry that we want to use. So uh, to get started, let's add a circle SOP here to our network. We're going to make a couple changes to this, and we'll see what some of these things mean. So with our circle, let's go ahead and set this to be a NURBS curve. Uh, we can leave it at 40 divisions here. We're going to want to attach this to a noise to kind of get a sense of what it is that we want to do. We can see we have a little bit of noise here happening. And then we're going to attach this to a null. Oops, a null. Pardon me. So in this, we can kind of see that we're uh, off to the right start. But if we take a closer look at this, um, and if we tip this on its side, we can see that we're actually uh, pushing this particular piece of geometry around uh, based on its Z coordinate uh, quite a bit, uh, which is great, but that's not exactly what I want to do. So one of the ways we might think about wrestling with this is uh, we could convert this to channel information. So I'm going to use a SOP2 chop. I'm going to, again, use a null, just in case I want to make any changes later on to this. And then here, I'm going to go ahead and insert a chop to SOP. And I'm going to use this, uh, what I just converted, uh, to be my target for that, right? So I've got my chop specified here. And in this case, uh, the scope that I want to look at, rather than looking at P, I want to look at N. I want to look at the normals as my attribute scope. And we can see here that's flattened this out for me. And it's also giving me a much different kind of take on how noise is working for my SOP. The other thing I want to do is I want to come back here to my circle. And I want to go ahead and specify this is an open arc. And that's going to give me a nice kind of like wireframe here which is totally what I want to be working with in this particular situation. OK, so we've got a little bit of geometry cooking here, which is great. Uh, cooking literally and figuratively. Ha 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 ha. Pardon the bad joke. Um, so let's render this. So there are a couple of different ways that we can uh, think about getting this into a render network. And the, the trick that I have not told you yet, um, because I love being able to tell you new tricks, is if we uh, right click on the output of this null here and we add a geometry comp what this will actually do is it will add an in and an out and it will turn on the display and render here inside of our geo with all that set up so rather than what we've done in the past where we've uh, added a geometry component and then had to dive inside and add a select uh, or add an in Right, we could do either one of those. 
So there's a bunch of extra work here that we could do to actually get this guy inside. Forget that. Instead, right click on the output here in comp. So let's add a geometry. And that goes, uh, that automatically adds an in and out for us. So that's nice and easy. Let's also add a camera. Because we need a camera. And let's add a render. We can see here, if we take a closer look, that we are in fact rendering this. But we need a material. Uh, and in fact, we need a constant, is actually what I'm after. I'm going to apply that to my geo as a material. And I am off to the races already. All right, one of the things I noticed there is I just saw uh, my frame loop here, right? And so if I watch my playhead, we're going to see a little stutter in that noise. And that's, of course, Right, because our noise here by default is set up to translate based on seconds, and we're going to change this to be abs time dot seconds. So now we've got something that constantly moves and shifts. Perfect, what we want. I'm going to go ahead and use my Geo's uniform scale to turn down the scale of this just a little bit, which is nice. It gives me a slightly smaller shape. And we're starting to get close now to what we actually want. So we're going to build a feedback network to make this happen, uh, but we're going to use a different technique than we've used before for part of this. So let's go ahead and add a constant here, and in our constant we're going to actually look at our render to help us define uh, the size of this. So I'm going to look for the operator called render1 for its width, and we're going to use that same technique to look for its height. Excellent. And we're going to turn down all of the alpha on that. So now we have just essentially an empty constant that's just full of alpha. Let's add a feedback top. We'll go ahead and feed that with our constant. Let's add a composite. We'll composite our render and our feedback together. Let's drag our composite onto our feedback network. We're not seeing anything yet, of course, because our composite's set to multiply. So let's set that to add. And now we can see that it adds in there, and that's starting to make some interesting progress, right? If we look at this a little bit larger, uh, we can actually see what it's doing here. And let's take a look at our feedback, and let's just kind of reset it to dump out the cache there. And we can see that we're getting close to making something a little more interesting here. Right? Part of the problem is the color. Uh, we max out our color here a little bit faster than we'd like to. So let's look at how we can fix some of that. I'm going to go ahead and shrink this down just a little bit and leave it over here on the right so we have it available as a reference. So to address some of this, I might come over here to my constant. Uh, I might start by uh, driving this white value down really low. It's going to seem like it's almost black. In fact, I'm just going to take hardly a step away from there. And we can see that's still pretty bright, uh, right? And as we keep adding that back to itself, we're going to get closer and closer to white as a value. So we could might uh, we could even think about turning that down maybe a little bit further. Yeah, and we still have got a lot going on there. I might even come in here to my constant and think about cranking down my alpha a little bit. So I have something that's really subtle and wispy. I might dial it in like maybe like 0.4. Yeah, now I have something that's really very ghostly, almost in its quality. This is moving a little bit faster than I like. Uh, it feels just like a little bit noisy to me. So let's go ahead and head over to our noise SOP and multiply that by, say, maybe like not 0.25. All right, that's going to slow that down a little bit. Let's reset. Okay. All right, that's that's getting there. That's got a kind of drifty, amorphous kind of feeling. And I'm feeling pretty happy with that so far, looking at it. I might turn down my alpha even more just because I want something that feels uh, really delicate, and that's that's getting closer to what I'm I'm looking for. I'm going to go ahead and change this, and we'll leave it at a solid, not 0.3. 
Excellent. Okay, so I'm going to leave this open. And for a second, what we want to do next is we want to think about how we can make this move and drift around our scene here a little bit. And I don't want this to be necessarily uh, predictable or linear. I'd like it to be a little bit kind of dancey, a little noisy. And so to achieve that, um, we can use a technique of leaning on some more noise. So let's go ahead and make a noise chop. And in our noise chop, uh, we're going to go ahead and in the channel page, we're going to set two different channels, X and Y. So TX, TY, bada bing, bada boom. I'm going to use uh, a series of selects here, right? Because I know that I'm going to need slightly different scales. We'll see what that means in one second, but trust me when I tell you that you're going to want to have an X and a Y separated out here as selects because what we're going to do is we're going to add a math next and we're going to want to scale these slightly differently. We're going to want to have a different scale for the X and for the Y in this. Next we'll merge. So we've put these back together and then we'll add a null at the end of all of this. Now as it stands, uh, the way that I put this together, we can see that I'm holding the whole sample, all 600 samples here, all together at once. And really what I want to do is I want to come in here to my noise at the front end, and I'm just going to time slice that. I can also see this is already moving pretty fast, so I know out the gate I probably want to go ahead and turn the period up to maybe something like 5 at least for us to get started. Okay, let's reset our feedback here. And what we can start to think about is how can we use these two channels to drive the position of our geometry? So if we come to our geo, let's go ahead and grab this TX channel and let's drop that right on our geometry uh, for the movement of our the X parameter for our geo. And we can see how now we've got something that's kind of dancing back and forth in this noisy kind of way. It's a little bit unpredictable. And we've got only that left-right translation. Now looking at this, I can see that uh, 1 is probably not enough, right? So in my X kind of scaling, I need to think about probably what I want is I want to go all the way up to 2. And this should mean here, if we keep watching it for a second, that we should have a little bit more range, hopefully in this X uh, that we're working with. We might have to be patient. Oh, yeah, look, we got a little bit further. So we might even think about making this like 2.5. So now we should have a little bit more left and right that we're working with. Yeah, perfect. It even falls all the way off the edge of our canvas which is excellent. I like that. We could dial that back down a little bit if we wanted to, but for right now I'm happy with the way that's working. So next we're going to use Y here to do the same kind of technique. So let's grab Y and let's dra drag that onto uh, the Y parameter for our geo. And we can see now that X and Y are going to drive X and Y respectively. And if we reset our feedback, we should now see something that's got a slightly unpredictable behavior in terms of how it moves and dances around the space here for us. All right. That is jamming. I'm happy with what that's doing and the kind of look and feeling for that. The one thing I'm noticing here is that sometimes it goes still just like a little bit too fast, right? I'm seeing tick, 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 uh, some of these slices that are happening. So we might come in here to our noise and we might turn that period um, up even a little bit further. Like, we might give it like 18 seconds. And now we've got something that's uh, sliced much more closely together and has a much more fluid kind of ghostly kind of quality to it. And that is excellent. I'm happy with where that's going. So let's come into our feedback. Let's reset that one more time. And now we can get kind of a sense of what it is that that looks that looks like and what that's doing for us. Okay, so let's think about color for a second because what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to drive some of the color here. And there are a couple different ways that we could do this. Um, let's take a look at two different methods. The first method is going to be kind of our jamboree method. Uh, and so let's add a noise top this time 
And instead of dealing only with monochrome, let's go ahead and turn that off. And so now we've got this multicolor uh, kind of noisy confetti situation going on here. This is what I mean when I say jamboree colors. Um, and to that end, what we're going to do here right out the gate is we're going to just reduce this down to a sample of one pixel by one pixel because that's really only what we're interested in. Let's animate that. So let's head to the transform page and under the Z parameter, let's go ahead and use abs time dot seconds maybe. That's a little bit fast for us, right? So let's multiply that by not point, uh, 0.01. Ooh, maybe like a little too slow, maybe just not point 0.1. Okay. I'm going to add a level top here because I know that I'm going to want it. We'll see why here in just one moment. And let's add a null here finally at the end of this chain. Now in the past we've looked at how we can sample this right over here. There are a few different ways that we could do this. Uh, we could go the kind of long way around and we could do a top two and then we've got RGB um, and we could have to, right, we've got to actually grab this and put it over here and, and now we've got an extra operator here. We can shortcut that a little bit if we instead just use an expression like this. So I'm going to look for the operator called null4 which is this one right over here and I'm going to dot sample. So I'm going to sample this operator and I'm going to sample it at the position where x is equal to 0 and y is equal to 0. And I'm going to look for the index 0 in that list that's returned, right? We remember, if we think back about uh, evaluating that kind of a, an expression. So let's go ahead and grab this. Yoink, copy. We're going to paste this right in here to Expressionville. If we turn off just this last portion for a moment, uh, if we take a closer look and even pause our timeline, we can see that we get, see that we get one, two, three, four values in the list. So it's red, green, blue, alpha are, is what's returned to us here. So if in this expression, if we add our square brackets and zero to the mix, we're really saying that we just want the item that's in the first position in that list, which is really helpful. So over here, Lo and behold, that's our red. Let's just copy that because we already did it once. So there's 0, 1, and 2. So I can retrieve all three of those values from that list uh, using these expressions over here. I'm going to turn my timeline back on. And we can see now that I've, uh, I'm sampling the color right out of here without having to use a top two chop. Okay, so let's look at our feedback and reset that one more time. And now we can see we've got some jamboree psychedelic colors happening. It's going to be very exciting. They're very bright. And we're, we've got a lot of uh, kind of white happening here, right? We're like ramping right into white values pretty quickly. Even though our alpha's turned way down, if we were to turn our alpha back up, um, we would hit these kind of white values, we'd peak really quickly. So let's go ahead and leave that at 0.25. We might also think about our composite method here. We're using add. If we tried over instead, that would give us a slightly different effect. But we still have got these kind of pretty bright colors and it's a little bit kind of rainbow city. Now we're fortunate in that we've turned down the uh, How do we want to call that? We've turned down the animation. Really, that's what we've done. We've turned down the animation of how quickly we're incrementing through through this. If we were to get rid of that multiplier, we could see that we, it's like, it really is Jamboree City here as we are just jamming through all of uh, Rainbow Town. So that's not totally what, I, what I'm interested in, right? I kind of like this quality uh, where it's a little bit more subtle. This still feels like a little bit too bright to me, even if with our, our blend mode uh, shifted. I'm going to go back to add. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take advantage of this level top that I added here. And I'm going to turn the brightness down a little bit, 
right? So I'm going to move even closer to that kind of dark, dark color. And now I'm going to reset my feedback again. And now looking at this, I get something that's still again closer to that kind of very ghostly kind of quality that I like to get started with. We've got real slow transitions in those colors, and we've got a real wide variety. We've got a wide sampling of color there. So this is an interesting kind of, you know, window screensaver almost esque kind of uh, animation, and uh, you know I'm jamming with it. I like this pretty well. This is treating me pretty okay. It could be a little bit darker, right? Like we peak here pretty quickly, but that's that's okay. I can live with that a little bit. I'm happy with that for right now. But this is just one way that we might think about how we're doing this, right? So this kind of relies on the fact that we're using noise as a texture operator to give us lots of different possibilities for what we might actually see here in the color as it's expressed. Now we could come in here to noise and we could look at our noise page and we could change a bunch of parameters and really kind of narrow it down to a small little chunk of that noisy spectrum. But maybe a better way for us to think about working with that would be instead to create a ramp. So if we take this and we make a ramp top, and let's go ahead and set this to be horizontal. I'm going to give this 200 by 1, right? I only need this really narrow little slice of a set of pixels. Excellent. I'm going to come over here and let's rearrange our colors here. So I'm going to select some new keys. So um, let's, let's try something different than what I did before. So maybe we want like a cyan, and let's crank our saturation or value. We'll probably want a darker color there. So I've got another cyan key there that's pretty close. I might dial that down again so these are similar to one another, right? There we go. I'm going to add a key here in the middle that's real purple. Whoa, is it going to be like so magenta-y, to be really great and exciting. And so now I've got this kind of slow transition from purple through magenta and then back, excuse me, from blue to magenta and then back out. And I might actually try to emphasize this a little bit more. We can always make some more changes here once we start to see what this looks like, which we might need to do. But for now, there we can see we've got a little bit of exciting gradient action happening. And I've set the key that's really different here in the middle. So we'll have some nice smooth animation because what I want to do is I want to animate the phase. So I'll use abs time dot seconds again. This is going to go woo, a little too fast. We can see how it's animating. So let's multiply that by not 0.25 again. We can kind of get a beat on where, how quickly that's moving. That's still a little bit fast to my eye, so maybe 0.1. Yeah, this is a real slow movement in this gradient. It's excellent. So what's going to be important is that we can plug this ramp right in here to our null, and we can see it's uh, working just fine. But what's happening here over in our actual constant is our expressions are only evaluating the sample that's at that uh, zero, zero position. So I'm only ever really watching this one single pixel all the way over here on the left. Which means that I'm going to have a gradient that animates through here. If we reset our feedback, we'll see a little bit of what that means. So we've got this bluey, purpley kind of situation. We should move towards magenta. And then we should move from magenta back towards the blue spectrum again. And we can see right there where our shift was, right where we've got keys that are slightly mismatched. That's OK for right now. We could really focus on how do we get that nailed down really tightly. And in fact, we could just edit our keys, our ramp keys, to make sure that was exactly the same. So I want my first key and my last key to be spot on the same. So let's just copy and paste some of our values there to make sure they are totally equal. Excellent. Now in this case, it looks like we're still like, right, we're slamming right into all of these bright values really quickly. I might, again, just head right up here into my level and take advantage of the level that I've already worked with. 
And now I should have, ooh, I've got this really smoky, dark, purpley, blue. Yeah. Right, so I've got this very mysterious kind of object that's animating and moving here in my space. And so that's really at the heart of, of what's going on in here. We might think of lots of different ways that we could animate this, right? We could use a camera to track the position of a person. We could use uh, a panel chop to track the position of a mouse if we wanted it to be uh, responsive to how we interact interacted with the user interface. There are lots of ways that we could really think about exploring the operation of this uh, in terms of its practicality. What I'm more interested in you seeing in this particular example is how we're actually able to set up uh, a piece of generative work that's making itself, right? We've established the kind of ground rules for how this thing is allowed to make itself. And now we get to just kind of sit back and see how those sets of algorithms really work in practice. Other things that we might think about as we kind of continue to futz with this and fight with this a little bit and explore it is we might think about our circle and is it really important for us that it's a NURBS curve? Our NURBS curve gives us this nice kind of liquidy, squishy kind of uh, shape. Uh, but what happens if we go back to, uh, instead of it, well, a primitive, we can see how that works, right? That's just a circle. Cool. We could switch back to a polygon. And we're going to have to jump over here and reset our feedback so we can see this happening. Our polygon at this point, right, with as many divisions as we have, our polygon feels just like not quite smooth enough uh, and not quite chunky enough, right? It just looks uh, kind of uh, ill, poorly planned. But if we were to crank this down to maybe like five, right, divisions, we can see now we're really kind of playing with the idea of what it means to experiment with different kinds of geom like geometric shapes. And again, let's reset our feedback so we can get it, kind of our eyes on that a little bit. Yeah, so now we've got this triangle um, that we can see moving around a little bit. And that's a totally different kind of, uh, kind of look, right? We might also think about uh, where rotation lives in some of this. So in our geo, we might think about animating maybe the Z rotation. And seconds might be too slow. We could use frame instead. There we go. So now we've got this kind of spinning, twirling kind of quality in what we're doing, right? Let's reset our feedback one more time so we can get a closer look at that. So now we're at a point where you really get to think about how you explore and experiment with what these uh, kind of techniques and what these rules might mean for you. And at the end of the day, when we look at any of the examples that exist in um, generative design or any of the, the kinds of examples that you might find other places on the web, really the heart of it is how do we understand the rules that are being established and then how do we exploit those in some interesting way? How do we create something that, uh, how do we create something with the math and the algorithms that, uh, and the principles that kind of uh, support these particular kinds of ideas uh, and how do we express that in some interesting way? So that's one of the things that we looked at here today. And I'm going to make another video for the second thing that we looked at so we can see them independently. So the last step here for us, right, is to go ahead and let's add a null to the end of all of this. So let's call our null BG. Let's move up a layer here. In our project one, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, reset my node size. And here in my panel, I'm going to change this around so that it looks for dot slash, look inside of me for BG, for background, and there it is. Lovely. So now uh, we've got our whole container that we can take a look at. All right. That's moving. That's jamming. Okay. We'll see you on the flip side, and we'll start to talk about the other thing we're going to work on.